Hello, Anthony. How are you doing, my friend? You okay? I'm good. How's it going, Lawrence? Yeah, really good, thank you. Uh, really good. How um how have you been finding <laughs> we to each other about what to wear? So <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was I mean <clears throat> playing some edgy boy band or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My other life. <laughs> How have you? Um, how have you been finding lockdown? You've been uh, keeping yourself busy. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the first sort of three, four weeks. I had a blast. I really, I enjoyed uh, the time off. I was so tired. I was exhausted, and it was really good just to do nothing and um, not hear an alarm, not get loads of emails and phone calls. And then about week four and five, that's when I was like. I need to see somebody. I need to get out and do things, do something. But um, yeah, it's it's been you know, yeah, I've had a pretty a pretty good experience when I know that it's been very difficult for lots of people. So I would be the last person to sit here and complain about um, having a hard time. It's been uh, it's been useful and good and mildly productive. I haven't written a great novel or a screenplay or something like that but you know it wasn't really about that it was about just sort of taking some time to uh i guess check back in with yourself and use yeah, it wisely definitely i think i know i think everyone had grand plans to like write a novel or uh, <laughs> do something really yeah. creative in this time but i think i've just i've just eaten a lot more than normal <laughs> it's the main thing i've yeah. done well, the internet was great. I mean, memes and uh, videos and all of that stuff. I mean, really hilarious. I've laughed more than I've probably laughed for quite a while. It's a lot of strong content, <laughs> short content going around every day, which is good. It's always good. Have you managed to keep in touch with um, much of the cast and crew during this time? Yeah, uh, I'm in touch with Killian uh, pretty regularly. Um, How is he doing? I saw Paul on... Uh, uh, Friday or Saturday. Um, that's one thing. I don't do days anymore. I do the recent past. That's how it works. I saw him a few days ago um, and he's great. Uh, Killian's good. He's in Dublin. Um, yeah, laying low. Um, and I spoke to Steve um, Knight late last week as well uh, in the recent past. Um, <laughs> yeah, the days just do seem to be yeah. merging into one. Yeah, uh, yeah, everybody's good. Yeah, they're just getting on with it. Um, yeah. Amazing. Um, I saw uh, on Instagram, you shared it, and we had a question in from, um, uh, Ju, from a girl called Ju on Instagram. <clears throat> and she was just asking about, in the future, do you think there might be more Peaky Blinders events and stuff? I know you guys had the festival last year, and there's announcement of that sort of Peaky Blinders being involved with NHS Fest. I wonder if you could chat to me a bit about yeah. that and what uh, in the future. I know a bit about it, but it's not something that I'm heavily involved in. I know that the next the Peaky Festival last year, or whenever that was, was so much fun. It was really, really great. And um, I think that proved that there's an appetite for it and that it works. Um, uh, and I think the next one that's going to happen, it was going to happen early next year, but I don't know because of everything that's been going on, if that's likely. Well, actually it's not, um, more than likely not gonna happen. Uh, but it was gonna happen in London. I don't wanna say where, because I don't know what, what is known or what's been said, but uh, it was going to be more like, I suppose, like a Comic-Con type setup. That was my understanding of, of how it was described. So it was in one venue, one place, and it was over uh, a couple of days. But um, yeah. It's a huge appetite for it, which is great. Well, fingers crossed it can <coughs> get, over the, get over the line eventually. Um, yeah. Uh, we had quite a few questions coming from people across um, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. <clears throat> and uh, one of the biggest ones, uh, which was an amazing scene from Series 5, was uh, around the shooting of the horse uh, very, mm -hmm. very on, early on in the series. <clears throat> and um, Laura on Instagram wanted to know if you could sort of talk us through how you guys went about shooting that scene, because it was really hard to get my head around. So. Uh, we, well, uh, it was all done for real. It was all done in camera. We didn't shoot the horse, but um, we, we worked, uh, there was a small group of us who worked very closely with um, 
Adam from the Devil's Horseman. The Devil's Horseman is the company that um, uh, we worked with last season and we'll work with on the next season. And they, they do lots of big movies and um, Game of Thrones and stuff like that. So they're really used to doing these kind of um, big uh, demanding sequences. But um, Steve had actually written in the script that we don't see it um, happen. And I spoke to him about it and he said, we, I said, why did you specifically say that we don't see it? And he said, because I didn't think we'd be able to A, do it and B, we'd be able to show it um, on screen. So I'd mentioned how I had wanted to do it. And he said, if you can do it, then amazing, go for it. And we worked it through with Adam and the Devil's Horseman and the horse was trained to do that move and it was on a pulley system. So there was a there was a guy at the back of the horse on the other side of the camera, and maybe I'll post a picture because it's easier. Like after this uh, is out, um, where he basically pulled this uh, lead that yanked the horse's head back, and it reared the horse up. And then what we did with that earth around the horse was we dug it up and we uh, put in softer earth and then we put the grass on top of it so that it was cushioned for the horse to land on and we set up I think we had two cameras and we did it maybe three times or something like that because the horse gets used to the action so after after the first couple of takes the horse is like well I know it's going to happen and I'm bored of doing that now <laughs> um, and then Killian stood was there standing in front of the horse and he um he was on a countdown basically. So off camera, um, I think John, the first AD counted it down like three, two, one, and then Killian just did the action of shooting the horse and the horse is pulled. And then we obviously added in the sound and the, 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 flare, the flare from the, the gun. And that's how we, we did it, but it's all in camera. And um, yeah, I was really proud of that sequence because that was one that we, it was a lot of discussions about health and safety, about Killian being that close to the horse, about the, uh, actually more of the conversations were about the health and safety of the horse, quite rightly. And, um, and Adam and uh, his team at Devil's Horseman just absolutely nailed it. And it, it's about, um, I always talk about it and you hear lots of people talking about it now because there's so much content that's out there and we're so used to receiving images uh, not only from you know Netflix and TV and streaming and whatever we're watching, but just everywhere we look, we're sort of bombarded with images. So really what you're trying to do in situations like that is create an image that's going to burn into your brain that you can't sort of unsee it, you know? So that's, if that's the one image out of six hours, I'd be very happy because it's very difficult to create images that stay in people's minds. Um, but yeah, that was a good one. Brilliant. I mean, I can still see it clearly now. Um, it was absolutely incredible. So it's amazing that so many elements came together for that one. Yeah. Um, it's good. Uh, recently, Stephen Knight uh, did a chat. Um, he did a watch along with uh, with Esquire of the Series 5 finale. And one yes. of the things he mentioned during that was uh, he wished he'd never killed off Amber Rama Gold. Um, yeah. And I just wondered if you felt the same. I mean, obviously, Aidan Gillen's an amazing actor. But yeah, do you, yeah. Do you know what he meant by that? And um, um, yeah, I do. We talked about it. We talked about it before we shot the Bingley Hall sequence, which was a huge undertaking logistically as well. Um, he had mentioned it and he'd also mentioned Barney because um, uh, Cosmo Jarvis is such a fantastic actor. But I think that's Steve's thing. He, he's, um, he loves all those characters so much. He doesn't want to kill any of them. But you have to, you know, you have to sort of let the show do what it needs to do and it has to evolve and you bring new characters in and you can't hang on to all of them and Aiden is a really good friend and I think he's fantastic and I think what he did in season five was really great really great work and uh, he's such a fine actor but um, I think Steve reacts the way fans react to stuff you know it's like you don't want to see people get killed but um, you know that it's a kind of part of the of the world and a part of the drama of it, um, and Aiden understood it. He was he was fine with it, and I think Steve. Then I remember him saying, "I remember we were in the Black Country Living Museum shooting something, and Steve was talking to me about Barney, 
I think we might have been shooting a scene that Barney was doing the, the, the practice shooting thing, the target. And he was like, man, that guy's really good. You know, maybe we shouldn't kill him. <laughs> got to kill him. You know, we've got to kill him. Um, so he was another one as well. I just but, imagine yeah. all the actors on set trying to give it a rule when, like, on the last day to make sure we're trying yeah. to be safe. But he did mention uh, Tom Von Lawler, who, who I didn't work with on Peaky, but I worked with Tom on um, a show called Love Hate, which Aidan Gillen was in as well. And that was an Irish gangster series. And Tom Von Lawler is just one of the finest actors out there. Um, so I completely understood um, what he was saying when he mentioned him. Brilliant. Um, one other moment from series five, uh, so having rewatched it again recently when it came to Netflix, there's that incredible moment where Alfie predicts the ending. Um, and I was just really intrigued to know, do you know how that decision came together? And was that, um, uh, were you hoping that people would clock it as that scene plays out? And like, what was the thought process behind that? No, I mean, that's just, I, I just think that's the, the genius of Steve's writing. He's very, he's, he's very able to kind of feed in those lines that you, uh, you don't pay attention to. And then all of a sudden they take on greater uh, meaning and significance. And I have often said it to Steve in the past that he's, he's a poet as well as a great writer. And I've said this before is that he writes beautiful prose, like in the action of a screenplay between the dialogue. It's not just, he walks in, he picks up, he sits down, he, you know, it's not just very kind of, blunt writing it's very beautiful prose so to to read his, his scripts is a joy but um the other one was um Churchill in episode the beginning of episode six says uh there would be the green shoots of another war yeah and the very opening the very first thing we see is the green shoot popping up through the the moor after the moor has been burnt down and I always loved that bringing that to the full circle as well I don't think anybody's picked that up, but I'm now putting it out there. Um, I just like that. It, was, it was two things. It was For me, the, the, it was like this green weed that was coming up through this burnt moor. And it was like, that's like the Shelbys. It's like, you just can't get rid of them, you know? Um, they, they pop up everywhere. Um, you know, they, they are survivors. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a great scene as well. And I always think of that two-hander with... Um, Alfie and Tommy, it's it's like a kind of Beckett play that's been shoehorned into um, an episode of Peaky, you know? It's very existential, that... Uh, yeah, that definitely. Whole... Yeah, very surreal, that moment. Very, very yeah. surreal. Yeah, and, and, and it makes total sense. And it... it, it uh, yeah, I loved, I loved making that. It was great. And um, next one I want to run past you, okay, is a fan theory, specifically regarding Series 5, that I keep, keep seeing popping up. And I'm not a fan of it, personally. Um, but it's around, it's, around a mo it's around a moment in the very final episode where you remember Oswald, just before he goes on stage, um, he's having sex with a woman um, in his dressing room. And we don't see her face. She's got blonde hair. And the going theory is that it's uh, Anya Taylor's Joy's character. Um, I'm not... I, I keep seeing it popping up and I just didn't, I, it didn't, it didn't sit right with me. I think like the goal of, the goal of him to be doing such a thing. Um, before the rally. Um, but yeah, I uh, keep seeing it popping up and I wanted to run it past you. No, she's, no, what, it's not. I mean, I would, I mean, I would have shown Anya Taylor joy. It would, there wouldn't have been a reason. It would have been more shocking to see her and know once and for all, but no, it was, um, I don't remember her name. She was a really lovely, uh, woman, um, came in and did that scene and it's all it's the worst um, doing sex scenes is always really difficult anyway um, and but usually you're working with somebody that you've spent you know weeks with or months with depending on what the job is this is somebody who just comes in that morning or that afternoon and is in the second half of the day and doing a scene so um, she was great, really lovely. And um, it's as much for Sam as well. You know, I think with Sam, he's playing this guy who's like really aggressive. And um, it was the same with Brenda who played the Swan. Again, really, really cool woman. Um, and it's just, you know, those conversations, having the conversations, working out the action, um, making sure at every point uh, both people know exactly what's going to happen 
um, so there's nothing is nothing is improvised at all and then you know creating a kind of comfortable environment on the set and having as few people around but it was definitely not Anya Taylor-Joy and it certainly wasn't a stand-in or her character um, so yeah no is the answer. That's really good to put that one to bed I'm glad, glad I was right all along. <laughs> um, next question comes from uh, Janet the General on Instagram and she wanted to know how come you guys stopped using mm -hmm. Janet the General interesting username um, how come you guys stopped using Red Right Hand at the top of every episode in um, Series 5? Um, I just personally felt it was being overused. And I think it had kind of, I think if you, well, if you, you overuse anything, it, uh, it loses its power, you know? And um, I felt that it had been firmly established that it's sort of, its association with the show is kind of cemented. It's not going anywhere. And I used it once at the beginning of, um, at the opening episode of episode one. And I think, I can't remember if it was season four, but I think it was season four that w whenever they'd used it, they were using cover versions yes. as well. So I just felt like it had been, it had been diluted and it had been overused. And so I, I took it back to the Nick Cave version to open the season. But then I wanted to strike out in a different direction um, musically, and I wanted to establish a, a different kind of musical language than that had been used previously. Um, and so it just made sense to not uh, use it or to use it over the end titles because then it becomes generic. And I didn't feel that the end titles uh, should be generic. You know, I wanted it, them to, to still feel part of the experience of watching the show uh, and we also um which hasn't been spoken about nor should it uh we removed the front titles from season five because i didn't want the audience to be distracted by people's names i was like if you're a fan of the show you know who everybody is and all the actors in the show are largely very well known so it's like you know they don't need to have their name on the at the front, I'd rather that you're watching Tommy walking through the field to get to the effigy, the scarecrow of effigy in the field and be completely engaged in that rather than you're like this and then you're like, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> like that, you know, and, and you're just reading names. So um, it, it was for that reason, really, with Red Right Hand. That's a really interesting choice. And I guess there's so many shows as well where they've kind of got like, that title sequence hard coded in, I guess in the age of Netflix, they've just got a, a skip button as well, where so many people aren't going to yeah, take the time to go through that anyway. And you don't want to yeah. want anyone skipping through Peaky. Peaky doesn't have um, opening titles. The opening titles are always over that first sequence, but it's usually that that sequence has meaning and it has power. And so to distract from that uh, is, I think it's a mistake. And, um, Annie Harrison Baxter, our, uh, our amazing producer, she worked for, oh God, I mean, a couple of months, um, just going back and forth and back and forth with all of the agents to try and remove the titles so we could do it. But I think it serves the show much better. And then in turn, when you hear Red Right Hand again, um, you'll remember it and you'll notice it. And so that's really the, 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 the power of using any of the songs, you know, you want, you want them to be heard and not just a mess of kind of music that's sort of plastered over when it doesn't need to be because the the, the writing and the performances are so powerful. Um, next up, we had a question from Norman Land on Instagram again. Um, <laughs> and this was to ask how you personally describe the season five finale. Like in your own words, like how would you describe what kind of plays out? Uh, how would I describe it? Um, well, the it's the big payoff, really, because it's probably the reason that I'm here as well doing the second, not the second season, season six. But it always, to me, it felt like they were too, um, too married together, season five and six, um, that it was the bridge of of one long story. Um, so it always. Oh, this is before I'd been uh, asked to come back um, 
it always felt like it would be weird to shoot that scene and then have somebody else come in and have to go back and pick it up and carry it on. And I just uh, felt very tied to telling that story. I think at the beginning, and I've mentioned this before and other things, is the journey of uh, that Killian has to go on with Tommy. Um, and it's quite dark and it's really about the descent of his soul and his psyche. And so taking him, which Steve tracks so well through the whole arc of the season, uh, to that point in the field where he's completely broken, um, is really interesting to explore dramatically um, and interesting to uh, work with somebody like Killian and go on that journey with him and help him out where need be. But to then finally be in that field felt like the culmination of a lot of work. Um, we shot that maybe two thirds of the way through, uh, or no, actually maybe not. We shot it maybe a couple of weeks before we finished. So no, it was quite close to the end. But um, uh, I love that moment because it's also something that you don't see a lot in, um, in TV dramas. I suppose maybe it happens a bit more now, but you don't see cliffhangers like that. It's very uh, unusual. And certainly with Peaky, Peaky was always sort of um, close-ended, you know, it was uh, beginning, middle, and an end. And then you'd start again and the show always jumps forward by a few years. So it was kind of interesting to, to do that. And there was a lot of discussions when we were, um, even when we were in prep about not doing it and about coming up with an ending that was quite, you know, definitive. But um, I kept pushing for it and Steve um, was very keen that that was the, the ending. Um, and I was even thinking, you know, and when we shut down and I was thinking, you know, if Peaky never happened again and that was it, it would kind of be an amazing <laughs> end. <laughs> Finale, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you never know. Um, um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, or but exactly. that was what we were thinking, or certainly what I was thinking around that moment, building to that moment. Uh, it was the culmination of it. I remember you mentioning a while back that um, there were sort of bits that you took out from that finale, but you still think from within it, you can probably work out who betrayed yeah. Tommy, like there's enough there. Do you think yeah. do you still stand by that there's enough in there for people to work it out if they're watching close enough? Um... Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I was trying to remember what, what we took out. Um, and also I'm thinking of the next season of what, what we're doing. Yeah, I do. I, yeah, I do. I think when you see it, you'll go, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> Have you seen anyone uh, online that's like messaged you anything that, that have cracked it, like completely got it straight away? No? No, no. I usually get... Um, just like, have you started filming uh, season six and when is season six coming out? And I'm like, there's nobody on Instagram or Facebook or, you know, I thought it was pretty clear we weren't filming anything <laughs> or nobody's doing it. Or I get a lot of, can I be in the show? I mean, I'm, like, I'm looking for the questions. We have to, <laughs> can you be in the show? When is season six coming? And uh, can Gillian yeah. marry? marry them was to the general one that kept coming up. Yeah, would you ask Killian, would he marry me or would you hook me up? <laughs> what you, I mean, are you serious? Yeah, a lot of, uh, can I be in the show? Um, and it's just like, uh, A, no, and B, no, we're not doing it. You know, nobody's doing it. You know, like, you look around. There's um, something much bigger than the show happening right now. This is true. This is true. Um, probably, probably a good point to sort of pick up chatting with you about series six so from what i understand from you said on instagram you'd like sets were built scripts were done like it's the costumes ready where whereabouts were you up to before everything got pulled we were uh we were five days away from filming and killian was three days away from having his hair cut there's part of me that wished he had had his hair cut <laughs> and then we shut down um but that's where we were and uh, and it was it was obviously bittersweet um, when we did shoot shut down because uh, it feels like it's so long ago now. Um, but the kind of specter of a pandemic and, the, and coronavirus was kind of just looming larger and larger every day. And we were doing tech recce, so we were all together on a 
on a coach driving around looking at all of the locations for the final time. And then throughout that journey, we, you know, we're on this big coach with tables or whatever, and we're all sitting around and we're, you know, looking at what's happening in real time going, it just does not feel like we should be doing this or how are we going to do this? Um, and then it just became apparent very quickly that there was no point in doing it. So I, I was, I was really pleased we didn't start filming because if we had a film for two weeks um, and then we're not picking up until, I don't know, the end of the year, or next year, or whenever we get it back on, up and running, um, you would more than likely go back and look at the two weeks and go, well, we can't use any of this stuff or we can use it, but we want to change other aspects of the script or, you know, with time. Um, well, actually, the realistic kind of practicalities now of filming have completely changed. So, um, you know, taking those into account, uh, how we how we safely mount the production again and bring the cast and crew back, how we regulate that, how we run it. Um, it's just a, it's a completely new uh, world. Yeah, I can imagine it must be really challenging. Like things like things that are so integral to the show, like intimacy and, and fight scenes and stuff. At a two mm. distance, like I don't, I don't envy you. That must be a really tricky challenge to try and surmount. Yeah, we're doing that. I mean, that's I'm spending a lot of time at the moment doing that, going through the scripts um, to try and figure that out. Um, we have a pretty good idea of how we're going to um, achieve those uh, those scenes, um, whether it's intimacy or fighting, um, and. Uh, what's the other thing that I was looking at recently? The scripts. Um, I'm trying not to give anything away as I'm talking about uh, season <laughs> six. Um, there's definitely a way to do it. I know that. And that's what a lot of this sort of downtime has been about. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's about all I can go into because I'll only trip myself up talking about scenes that I'm not supposed to be yeah talking. yeah that's all right I'm not I'm not here to trick you don't worry um I guess like it's such an unknown thing when we chatted ages ago about this you were looking at kind of maybe early 2021 to, to finally see something I mean I'm guessing it must be 20 like early 2022 mid 20 like it could be realistically so yeah I have a good I mean, number of thought wouldn't it yeah, at this point, I have no idea. I mean, in an ideal world, it would be it would be great to be prepping again towards the end of the year with a view to start shooting early next year. That feels achievable. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea. It's it's kind of what we're discussing and talking about. Um, but you know, as lots of people know, we were we were due to start filming um, in was it the end of March or something like that until the end of July so we'd still be filming and uh, so it takes that long so if we say if we did start shooting in January uh, we wouldn't finish until I don't know May June and then it's another sort of six months of editing um, so yeah it does take time and unfortunately you know when we actually when we started prep it was going to be the shortest gap between seasons, which I was really excited about because... Especially with how it ended as well, because <laughs> people are very, very oh, keen to see what the two, I think season four and five was like, it was quite a while. It might have been two years. And now this is probably going to end up being, being longer. But I promise it, it will be worth the wait. It's given us an opportunity to go back to look through the scripts again. And, you know really kind of nail it in a way Maybe. that um i mean these scripts were so so good and now having had this even more time it's um you know you go what about this or what about that you know and it's like oh yeah shit, that's a good idea so there are you know it's working out how to do all these things um safely and responsibly and you want the audience to be watching the show and not be thinking about social distancing or something that looks weird or and you don't want to shoot it in a certain way that makes you feel like it, it's it's not peaky it's done in a way that has to be done mm. so that's what i'm working very hard on at the moment to try and get 
that right um, and strike that balance. And um, I think that's really important. That's the most important thing. Absolutely, yeah. Obviously, definitely. I would say, well, you know, I was I did go back and scan through season five, and most of those scenes are naturally socially distanced. You're talking about like, Peaky Blinders. They don't kind of, you know, they're not hanging out together. Um, any scenes in the office, like that scene with Mosley and Tommy and uh, Arthur and Michael, you know, they're all spread out. So if you go through those scenes. You know, any, a lot of the scenes in the garrison bar the big kind of crowd scene where they come in and they're getting everybody to drink or whatever, but the family scenes, they're usually kind of pretty well spread. So I don't think that'll be affected. It's more fight scenes and um, any scenes of in intimacy, you know, that's where you really have to figure it out. Fingers crossed, really can't wait. I'm sure as most people do, can't, can't wait to see how it turns out, but um, best of luck, best of luck with tackling it. Um, one one question from uh, Kakibo on Instagram. Uh, she said, how does it feel to be carrying on doing another series? And would you be up for directing beyond series six? I know Steve has kind of talked in broad terms about there being a, a series seven at some stage. Do you think it would be is, is two series enough for you? Or do you think if the opportunity was there, you'd want to continue? Yeah, I mean, there are other stories that, that I, I want to tell, but this this, the world of Peaky Blinders is, um, I mean, first of all, I was a fan of the show before. I've said this before, it's a real gift to be able to step into that world and then to bring uh, your take um, on it along and then have that accepted um, is a real gift for any director. Um, I love the cast. Um, I love Steve's writing. Um, it's you know, it's the best show for me that's out there. So to be uh, a, a kind of part of its history um, is, is great. So, yeah, I'm really, I mean, you could, if you look at the kind of the business of it, you could go, well, I, you know, I don't want to stick around and do season six because it's going to like mess up my time frame or whatever, you know, you're thinking about. But that really didn't pop into my head. I'm, like I just said, it's like I'm, sort of tied to telling that story and it feels very much uh, a two-part story to tell and we finished part one and you know um, I'm really excited to finish that part of the story and whether uh, whether that's it or there's another season I don't know because you're looking at it as it's years of of time of your life you know where you're you're committed to something so I'm not being vague I'm definitely committed to to this, and this is going to be quite a long journey. Um, uh, and, you know, I love working with Steve, and I love working with Killian and Helen and Paul and Natasha and Kate Phillips and, you know, everybody. So they're a joy to be around. So, it, I mean, the bottom line is it's a huge gift um, for me, uh, but it would be for any director. So I'm just excited to get back and do season six and tell that story because um it's amazing it's really great brilliant stuff um uh, on the top of, the, of series six still sophia on instagram wanted to know i know this might be a tricky one for you so let me know if you can answer it will will series six pick up directly from where we left off or are we going to see a little bit of a movement in time at the time jump uh thinking <laughs> um i know the answer i'm thinking uh, yeah, it picks up directly. So we, we, it will, uh, yeah, the very first image you see will be back in that field with, uh, okay. me, uh, with a gun to his head. Amazing. And then we, we will move on from there. Brilliant. And we will uh, resolve that <laughs> um, amazing moment. Yeah, uh, it's it's great. It's very, very, I mean, I remember, I don't know if I said this to you or somebody else, I was talking, uh, I was editing episode six. I don't remember what months these were, but I was editing episode six and, um, and I was with Paul Knight, the editor, who's coming back as well. And we, we had just watched a kind of longer cut. At one stage we were, episode six was, 
we talked about it being a feature episode and we had uh, very kindly got a, a dispensation from the BBC to be able to uh, make, I think it was like 75 minutes or something like that. It was going to be, so it was going to be like a feature length episode. But then as we were cutting it and cutting it, it just kept coming down and, um, and I'm not, I'm not going to make something 75 minutes if it doesn't work. So we made it the best length it was, but we'd watched this particular cut and then we finished it and I was checking my email and I just got episode one of season six from Steve. And I was like, shit, do you want to know what happens? Cause I didn't know, I hadn't spoken to Steve about it. So you're only, you're cutting what you have knowing the story. And then I, uh, I opened up the script and I started reading it out loud to Paul because we'd literally just finished it. And uh, he, was, he was laid out on the couch. And I remember I ended up reading the whole script. I've never read a script out loud before, but like I said earlier, Steve, Steve's dialogue is like, it's, first of all, it's so, it's so beautifully written, but it's also very quotable dialogue. And then the prose, um, it's like reading a novel. He writes novelistically. Yeah. So I ended up reading the whole script out loud. And Paul was just lying out on the couch going, holy shit. <laughs> um, really, really extraordinary. So yeah, we have that. And then the only other thing I'd say is there's quite a long sequence that's very like um, a kind of Sergio Leone style, slow building um, sequence um, of a lot of moving parts slowly merging. And uh, it's a really, it's, it's, it's pretty great. And I haven't seen, Steve hasn't written anything like that um, in any of the previous seasons or in any of his other work. So that's a, a sequence that we were all really excited about um, filming and it took us a long time to find a location um, and, uh, and to put it together really. So it's, it's, it's a huge kind of undertaking to go and do this in a TV drama that is, um, you know, that doesn't have the budgets that, you know, a lot of the bigger American shows have that we're competing with, but it will certainly look like it. So that's something I, I can't wait to, uh, to, to film. And, and that was also something at that stage, having not finished season five and reading that first screenplay, it was like, fuck, I can't wait to do this. I yeah. gotta do this. You know? Perfect timing for it to drop as well. <laughs> Absolutely perfect timing. It, was, it couldn't have been better. Couldn't have been better because we'd literally just watched the cut and then it was like, hey, do you want to know what happens in the field? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's great that that's something that other people want to see as well. But yeah. yeah. Would you ever, do you think you'd ever consider having longer episodes in the future? Do you think when you're working on series six, was that specifically something you thought for the finale of series five? We talked about it. Uh, we talked about it for... We talked about it, I think, for the opening episode of six, but um, and then we talked about it for the final episode of season six. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, the the idea is great, and you know, it's it, it it would be cool to do. But I I want to watch the best episode. I don't want to watch the longest episode. So I would always just cut cut for quality and not just uh, for the duration. Um, uh, if it works, great. But season six, sorry, episode six was a feature length and it played well, but it, it felt long and it just, I just kept coming back to it going, mm. you know, I'm not here to indulge myself. I get enough out of what I do in telling the story. So I wanted to keep cutting it back and, tighten it up and so it just felt like it was the right thing to do cool. um, and I think some of those scenes went out as well on the um, yeah the cut ones came out on iPlayer yeah yeah because yeah, I ended I went back and we recut them and we mixed them and graded them and um, and we did that so yeah I'd forgotten about that so some of them were on their separate scenes and they're fine in they're 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 fine just as an isolated scene but if you're watching it in the body of the, or the structure of the episode starts to drag um similar question regarding um series six uh 
and again I imagine you're probably going to see too much detail but will there be will there be new characters in series six I guess the likely answer is probably yes <laughs> yeah I mean there's always new characters um um there is uh, there is a great female character who's new who um is pretty dark and um I haven't seen a character like her uh in Peaky before um uh, I wouldn't say who she is but uh she certainly gives Tommy a run for his money and she's um you know she uh she challenges him in a different way basically um i don't know she's she's certainly not a protagonist and i don't know if she's an antagonist but she's a, a, a kind of right uh, bit in the middle yeah yeah often the worst kind you know <laughs> um and and again it's sort of is similarly to mosley who who she has a similar ideology um uh and that's challenging, you know, for any character because, like I've said before, it's like, you know, he or she, they don't have guns or a gang, but they have an ideology and it's like a virus and it's um, it's more dangerous than, than anything. So, um, and I know that Steve really enjoyed writing her and you can tell um, in the writing. So she's a really great character and uh, we were really close to casting her as well that was it's been quite a long time um, on that who else uh, no that's no, that's it for now oh i it? mean that's that's plenty plenty yeah, plenty going that's, on with i think very exciting times um on season six if i was to ask you this is from um alex b on instagram um if i was to ask you to describe series six in three words what would they be do you think uh, pretty fucking epic. Okay. I think. <laughs> uh, Someone suggested not done yet when they saw that question. That's a good answer. It's also true. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I think I prefer that. Not done yet. Uh, yeah, more to do. More to do. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't. I, I honestly don't know. Um, having now spent this amount of time with uh, Steve Knight and. Uh, I don't know how he does it. I really don't. Um, you know, if you if you think about the amount of people who have written every episode of of, of a show, you could probably count them on one hand. Um, uh, I think it's a pretty extraordinary achievement. Uh, uh, I don't know how he does it. But, um. This one's picking up on something you posted on Instagram a little while ago. So you mentioned that um, black and gold are quite key themes for the next series. I wonder yeah. if there's anything you can elaborate on with that. Um, I'm thinking... Um, <laughs> no, because gold... Gold has quite it's quite symbolic and it has greater significance um, in the middle of, of the season. Uh, and for, for kind of personal reasons for, uh, for Tommy. Um, uh, black is, a, I mean, black, it's the, I mean, it is boys from the black country and it is Birmingham. So it's something that's there and it's, 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 I mean, look at the two of us. Um, <laughs> yeah. We obviously picked up on the theme. Yeah. Um, and am I right in thinking the first episode's called Black Day, isn't it? Cause I think that script. Yeah. 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 Um, and it carries through uh, the, the arc of the season. You're also picking up, I mean, you've just taken him all the way to the end of, se of episode of season five, um, where he's broken, and he is in he is in a dark place. And so, can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can just about. Yeah, sounds like something uh, dark going on out there. <laughs> something dark happening in uh, in London. Uh, so you're 
so you're kind of uh, you're following that through, but I can't talk about it specifically. Cool. I post pic I posted pictures. That's what we did. Yeah, of the bar. Also, like I'm constantly going, what what have I said out loud? And <laughs> what have I said? Yeah. So the garrison looks amazing. So it's that back room of the garrison. We spent a long time getting that right, and I can't remember what the other two. No, they were all. I think they were all the garrison. Uh, those pictures that we that we posted, um, yeah, uh, yeah, gold is definitely a theme, a running, a, a symbol that runs through it quite predominantly. Awesome. Um, uh, and then there was a question around the soundtrack for series six. I know Anna's returning. Um, she did the. I will be returning. I'm just getting warm. Oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> I'm back. So um, Bubble Bubble Double on Instagram was asking, um, will the musical arrangement that you kind of have for series five continue for series six, or is it going to be more patchwork with lots of different songs being used? I think we had a similar question around, will the music oh, be just as punky in this series? So what can you tell yeah, us? Um, yeah, Anna, Anna Calby is, is going to come back. Um, um, she certainly said yes, so she better. Um, <laughs> I, def I, I loved working with Anna and um, yeah, having been such a big fan of hers for, for the, I mean, whatever, I mean, whenever she started, um, to then spend uh, that time with her and get to know her and work with her uh, was a real gift as well. So she's definitely coming back and I want to keep pushing um, what she has now established uh, in Peaky and take it in a different direction. Um, so we're definitely going to keep exploring that. Um, Anna was actually going to start, I think she'd read three of the scripts um, and she was going to start composing music based on having read the scripts and send them uh, send sketches while we were filming. Um, uh, then what's really useful is because it's the same composer. This was something that as well with the red right hand, whoever, whoever asked that question earlier, was that the reason, because season five was so dark and it was, it was like a character piece and a character study of the darkness of Tommy Shelby's um, psyche, um, I wanted to use less contemporary music or commercial tracks and use more of a score but in order to make the score feel like it felt part of the landscape of the show it was important to use a, like um not that Anna's a commercial artist but a, a commercial recording artist to tap into that um you know and all those Ry Cooter soundtracks that he did with uh, Vim Fenders um that uh, kind of iconic guitar sound that that's what Anna Calvi does um, so that became important to me. So that's why the red right hand had that sort of big opening moment as a nod to, you know, this is the theme and this is who this man is. And he's, the, you know, he's riding the horse on the moor. Um, um, and you see him approaching the red, the phone box. Then after that, Anna takes over directly from red right hand and, um, and basically puts her stamp on that kind of opening sequence of intercutting these various uh, places. So we're going to continue that in um, season six. And then I think I've spoken to Anna about this, but she is going to do a, her own version of Red Right Hand. Amazing. And probably do it as a duet. Um, and I know we've talked about, but I won't say it here in case it doesn't happen or they don't want to do it or they're busy or they can't do it or whatever, but it was going to be a duet. Um, and, uh, and then the commercial tracks. Yeah. I mean, it basically, did you ask me about that music or was it just about Anna's music? Uh, I mean, anything on the music is really interesting. So I know you, you've, did you say you've been doing some work looking at kind of what tracks you might include for the next series as well? Yeah. Um, so myself and Killian have like a Spotify playlist that we we just put songs that we are listening to. This we started this last year, late last year, um, uh, 
uh, of stuff that we like and that we're listening to at the moment. And we've been doing it through um, the, the pandemic as well. And so we've got this quite a big playlist of tracks. And essentially then what we, what we do is when I get into the edit, uh, Paul Knight, the editor and myself, we kind of, um, you say like auditioning tracks, but you basically, it's not, you're not auditioning tracks. You're just playing the tracks against certain scenes that you have earmarked uh, music for. Um, and then you see which one works. And a lot of the times you've got pieces of music that you, in your head, you're kind of thinking of the images and you're playing the song in your head. But then when you watch the song and listen to the song against the cut scene, it just doesn't work. Yeah. We had that a lot last season. And it's really, it's, it's, it's weird when you have a song that you're convinced is going to work and then you watch the images back and it just doesn't fit. Um, but we do have quite a big uh, playlist on Spotify that we're um, uh, contributing stuff that we're hearing. And um, I think I will, I spoke about this before and everybody's up for it, but I, um, and we might still do it. And I actually, I'd forgotten because there was other stuff going on, but I wanted to put out like a, a short selection of songs um, that may or may not end up in the show, uh, whether they work uh, or not, I don't know, or whether the band or the artist doesn't want it to be used. You know, you never know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but just to put out like a sort of almost like a tonal thing that, you know, this is the, this is where we're, we're headed or this is the kind of music that we're, we're listening to. I mean, that'd be good. I, I for one, would love to hear that. I imagine a lot of people would. I feel people might be furiously searching for your secret I like playlist to. and spot right now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make sure it's secret. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I love that kind of music discovery thing. No. Okay. Might... Oh. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that it's um, not public. Well, fingers crossed um, for that one. I hope, hopefully we all get to hear that playlist at some stage. Yeah, there's some good, there's some good bands um, that we've been listening to. Um, so yeah, hopefully some of them make it onto the uh, into the show. Amazing. But there's actually, you know, if you think about it, there's I don't know, there's maybe might be ten, ten spots over the six hours or something. I think. I mean, you never know until you do it. But I, I, I don't know how many were in season five. I don't remember the number. Uh, and you listen to an awful lot of music um, before you find those songs. Um, so yeah, but I, I enjoy that part of the process. And there's some great music at the moment. There's some really great bands that are out there at the moment. So absolutely, yeah. I think that's one. That could be one good thing to come out of all of this uh, lockdown and stuff. Yeah. like that. The people, like, yeah, the bands I know start making great music in this time. So hopefully that will be one. Well, yeah, we well, very lucky to hear Idol's new album about a month ago, and uh, it's so fucking good, like so good, and it's hard to follow up something that was so great with um, Joy as an act of resistance, but they've done, that's a, it's an absolute banger, so um, hopefully something of theirs will sway in there. Amazing. But for Anna Calvi. Um, Nathan Clark on Instagram, I imagine this would be quite a popular question, uh, wanted to know where did Tommy and the cast get their suits made? Oh, um, I now have two of them, personally. Oh, wow, really? Uh, yeah, uh, well, Alison, first of all, Alison McCosh should get a big mention because she's the costume designer who did season four and season five and she was coming back to do season six. Costumes are just extraordinary. Um, so she had traveled all around Europe. She does that mainly, actually, mostly for the uh, for the female cast. Uh, these in, like incredible vintage dresses that she got in Rome and Madrid and Paris, and I think she got some from LA as well. Um, uh, but they're just like they're one-off pieces, so they buy them. Most of them have been preserved and they're in amazing condition and then she can do what she needs to do with them. And then some come in and they're in rag order and she fixes them up and makes them really beautiful, which is unusual because in, usually you have doubles or triples of costumes in case 
um, in case somebody gets shot and they have to have blood all over it or they spill something on it during the scene and you know you need to go and get them but these are all one-offs um, but with the men uh, Alison works very closely with a master tailor um, a lovely Irish man called Ronnie Johnson who's based in Dublin and he has been doing the suits maybe for three years now or something like oh, that. Wow. So he flies over, measures the guys. I think he does Killian, Paul, Aiden. Um, I think he did Sam Claflin, maybe one of his suits or, or his tux, something like that. Um, uh, and maybe Finn Cole as well. Uh, but with Killian, he does everything. Um, and this time I was in Dublin and Killian who's obviously lives in Dublin and we flew over and we met Ronnie at Killian's house and he was there. Killian was like wearing the kind of, the, um, the kind of shell of a suit, you know, with all the threads and, you know, no arm and it was like classic tailor. But he makes his overcoat as well. Um, so he makes everything. Um, but they're so beautiful. They and Alison talks about, um, and you'll see it if you watch the show, uh, or you'll probably notice it more, but it becomes really important visually because you're creating a silhouette, you know? And when you think of the Peaky Blinders, you think about them wearing those clothes. And if you think about her contribution and what she's done over the last two seasons and will continue to do in season, hopefully in season six, um, it's the silhouette of, um, and the shape and the way he moves. And we talked a lot about his coat. So he's having a new coat made. That coat is like, it's cashmere. The whole thing is absolutely stunning. It's a cashmere overcoat, which then I was thinking, I was like, you know, <laughs> we were supposed to be filming and it's just been, you know, so hot. Um, it would have been pretty miserable. And then I was also thinking that it wouldn't look like peaky. It would just be really sunny. We'd spend so much time trying to block yeah. out the sun. <laughs> um, uh, so everything for a reason. Uh, but uh, yeah, Ronnie Johnson, master tailor in Dublin, um, and a beautiful guy, lovely man, and, um, and he's really quick. But those suits are beautiful, and I got him to make me two of them. Very jealous. Is it, is it right that Peaky Blinders uh, brand has its own sort of like suit division, I think? I know they sell hats and things. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, <clears throat> It's it's Garrison Taylor's. Yes, yeah. And that's, I think that's Steve Knight's yeah. company. But no, Alison, Alison and Ronnie have nothing to do with that. Right. That's a secret thing. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I have a lovely coat, overcoat, that, um, that Steve uh, very kindly uh, gave me from Garrison Taylor's, and I wear it all the time. It's beautiful. Amazing. I'll have to check that out after this. Um, although it's not the weather for big, big heavy coats at the moment. No, it's not. no. <laughs> I finished that in Manchester just before prep, or before we were supposed to shoot. It was the end of the, uh, was the end of the big coats. But we'll probably be wearing big coats again when we start filming. True. Um, yeah. um, and then I've probably got one final one for you uh, that I wanted to ask. So if you could bring back one character, no strings attached. Obviously, we saw Tom Hardy come back as Alfie Solomon's last season um, if you could bring back anyone no strings attached from the history of Peaky um, for the future who would you want to bring back do you think oh uh, from any any season any season oh for me um, can't remember her name the Russian the Russian princess was uh, she yes. yeah 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 played by is it Gaita or Gaita Gaita Jensen or Johnson I don't I, I, I didn't work with her but I remember that season and she was so fucking good mm -hmm. and I hadn't seen a female character like that before somebody who was so clever and so smart and also completely unpredictable and then completely insane um, uh, and she's the only person who she, uh, she's the only person, only character, who has completely um, unhinged uh, Tommy. 
I mean, Tommy has unhinged himself, but um, she was so crazy that he didn't know what she was going to do. So you're talking about a man who has, you know, playing this sort of master game of chess and is way ahead of everybody. And he's like three or four moves ahead of everybody. And then this woman comes along and every time he thinks he knows what her move is going to be, she kind of usurps him into something completely different. Um, I really enjoyed watching what she did uh, with that role. Um, so yeah, and she's still alive. As oh, well. true. Yeah, this is true. It's true. There's always still time. <laughs> still, but the others are dead. I mean, Sam Neill is Sam Neill. And he's just so good. I also loved Charlie Creed Miles, Billy Kimber, who kind of set the yeah. set the bar. Um, <laughs> Charlie is so wild. Uh, I thought he has amazing energy, but um, yeah, she was she was incredible. Tatiana, is her name Tatiana? Tatiana? I was just thinking it just came to me, Tatiana. Yeah, uh, I remember she, her bellowing about the um, the cursed jewels and the the cursed uh, yeah cursed gem. She's crazy. <laughs> that scene up and down where she. I think they're having sex and then she gets out she leaves and she takes the gun and goes downstairs and he's and he's he's like put the gun yes, down his poor, his poor housemaid francis isn't it that, uh yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah he's like go to bed and she, you're just like holy shit is francis yeah. um, is francis still around i guess we didn't see much about yeah. her. she's yeah. still around i love her she's she's like yeah she's so put upon <laughs> i mean what a job she earns her wages <laughs> yeah but she's so she's so lovely and so friendly and really talented and she she's one of those actors that communicates so much with her face you know that's the i mean that's a gift you know? i mean killian is doing it with his eyes constantly you know you look at somebody like her as well she's and she's a really lovely woman yeah she's definitely coming back brilliant great stuff um, well, thank you so much for your time, Anthony. I super, super appreciate it. Thank thanks you. for all those questions. Yeah, good um, to see you. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say, I guess, to Peaky fans before we, before we sign off? Uh, God, I don't know. No, other than, you know, what is it not done yet? That's about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fucking no, we will be back. You know? <laughs> we'll be back. Um, no, I think I've said, I think I've said everything that needed to be said, you know, we, it's, it's, it's a different world that we're, we're in now, but, um, but Peaky will, will return and, um, yeah, it, it will be better than ever before. Brilliant. But, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get to see you, uh, in real life sometime soon and good luck with, um, good luck with series six. Wouldn't it be great, Lawrence? <laughs> no more zoom calls. I know. My God. I think I've had my I look forward. I look <laughs> At least forward. the internet hold up. <laughs> yeah i know yeah exactly all right thank you so much thank you bye everybody bye